Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we're kicking off a series on the Prince of Egypt. Um, well, not the movie. You might have thought that when I said that. But we are going to talk about the life of Moses, um, using as our source text the actual Bible. Um, but we might reference the movie because it's it's pretty good at some points. Um, but the first thing we learn about Moses is who his parents are. They have names, and they are Jochebed and Amram. Would you like to tell us about them, Greg? <laughs> no one ever remembers Amram. Amram. Um, largely because he, he he doesn't show up so much in the story. We. We're told a number of times about the parents, so obviously he's involved. But the, the mover and shaker in the story is Jacobet, his wife, who is a daughter of Aaron. Of of Levi? Of Levi, I'm sorry, not Aaron. Yeah. Levi, because Aaron's her, her child. Yeah. Mm. Boy, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very alert right now. Um, <laughs> let's let's uh, actually read what the text says. There went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And as we look at the other genealogies, it's very clear that she was not just a daughter in the generic sense of being descended from the house. She actually was a daughter, probably Levi's last or next to last child. Whereas Amram was descended from an older sibling, so was in was actually Jacobed's nephew, but they probably were about the same age. Would people live to be a really long Still time? Still weird and gross. Yeah, well, there's that. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Goodly child. Fair to God, another passage says. We're, we're never really told in so many words what it is they saw in the child. Did he glow? Probably not. Um, but were, was there something tattooed on his on his head? Deliverer of Israel. I we're not <laughs> told, uh, but somehow these two parents saw that this child was special. Not that that necessarily would have changed the storyline, but it was an encouragement because backing up a chapter to Exodus one now, uh, some things have happened. We sort of skipped through or skimmed through Joseph. Uh, Joseph had been sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers. He had risen to become vizier of Egypt. When famine came, one, he had predicted it. Two, he had prepared for it. And three, he waited for his brethren to show up. And then he put them through a series of tests to make sure that they themselves had grown spiritually. And he was satisfied uh, with God's work in them. He believed it was real. And so he reveals himself to them and then ends up bringing the whole family down to Egypt because there's food in Egypt. It's not good food in any place else for a while. That was a while back. Joseph, Joseph has died. That generation has died. Some time has passed on. And there has arisen a new Pharaoh who does not know Joseph. It doesn't mean he'd never heard of Joseph. It doesn't even necessarily mean he'd never met him. It means he has no connection with him. He has no love for him. He is not in sync with him. Uh, Joseph is one of them, uh, one of those people on the other side of the tracks. He's part of our problem as the population of Israel continues to explode. And he is of the mindset that these people are a threat, that uh, if some other nation wanted to invade Egypt. Not sure who exactly that would be, but maybe he had someone in mind. That Israel would rise, could maybe rise up and join the invaders. And basically, we, we, we have this threat living in our midst. We need to do something about them. Uh, his first move was to enslave them, to make them workers in his uh, his public construction work. But as the people continued to grow, even under that severe bondage, he just decided, look, let's let's just cut to the chase, kill the kill the boy babies. Let's get rid of all the male infants, throw them into the river, and that will end that. We'll we'll keep the girl children, they'll assimilate into our culture, and their culture will die. We have a word for this. This is called genocide. 
but but more than that this is the war of the serpent against the seed of the woman we've if we've watched through the story of genesis we've seen this come up again and again and here it is on a massive scale all of god's covenant people are in one place they are enslaved they have no freedoms they have no leverage they have no one to step in and help them and something the text only hints at we we hear it a little bit more clearly later uh, they have fallen victim to the lure of egypt all the the giant statues the colossal gods the the immersion of magic has begun to win their hearts over they are becoming practicing idolaters and this is the culture into which this baby is born uh, and Jacob and Amram have to have a good deal of faith to see that in spite of it, of Israel's apostasy, in spite of the overwhelming power of the enemy, of this attempt of the, the serpent, the dragon in Egypt in scriptures, again and again represented as the, the dragon. Remember the, the double, twofold crown of Egypt with the, the cobras mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. In spite of all that, God is still God. He still keeps his covenant promises. And what he has told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's going to pull off. Now, does that mean we sit here and wait for God to do that? Or does that mean we run some kind of assassination program on the current Pharaoh? Or is there perhaps an option? It's neither of those. Well, Jacobin comes up with this incredible plan. Let's hide the baby. There are limitations <laughs> on that plan. <laughs> They can be noisy, I hear. Yeah, I was sitting in church last night, and it was, um, <laughs> praise God for covenant children. It was noisy at times. Um, and praise God that you are all together. Yeah, too. that was wonderful. I, I, I didn't mind, but, you know, it's if, you, if someone had gone looking for baby sound, they would have found it quite easily in our church. <laughs> Um, and although Amram and Jacob had, uh, no doubt lived in the Hebrew quarter, as it were, later on in the story of Moses, we find out that not all of God's people could be trusted. Um, she hid him three months. I, I'm not sure how she did that. She went on pretending to be pregnant for three months. Um, but sooner or later, people can count to nine. And um, the baby's going to cry. And the, the spotlight of Scripture here falls upon her. She's apparently the one with the plan. Presumably she consulted her husband if he was available, but we're not told exactly. She has this, this great idea. Pharaoh's daughter is barren. She has no child. There is therefore no heir to the throne. Two, Pharaoh's daughter has a regular bathing spot in the Nile. It's among the reeds that is among the papyrus because crocodiles don't like papyrus. They're, I don't know if they're allergic to it or if they just resent it on principle, but they they don't go they don't go near it. Um, you can use that for books and such. And yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jacobet made this a little ark, and and the word is the same that's used for Noah's ark. So there we should see the echoes here. God's promise and God's people surviving in this little vessel that's going to be carried by the water, except it's not going to be carried very far. If you if you you mentioned Prince of Egypt earlier, and also there's uh, Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. In both, we see the little ark put on the Nile, and we see it float down the currents. <laughs> and in Prince, Past the crocodiles. Yeah, in Prince of Egypt, foot. there's actually crocodiles snapping that. <laughs> that would be stupid, and, and Yacobet <laughs> is not stupid. She doesn't send it floating down to whatever God wills or whatever, wherever fate may carry the thing. She puts it very specifically where Pharaoh's daughter bathes. She sets it among the reeds, among the papyrus. And, and then she, she leaves, but she leaves her older daughter, Miriam, who would have been you know, not, not terribly older, a little girl, to, to sit and watch and 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 look for opportunity. She probably I never thought much about this till now. But you know, I I I know small children who I would trust with a very important errand. I don't know many of them. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of one dear little girl in our congregation right now. She is so much fun. I wouldn't trust her with any serious errand ever. Um, <laughs> 
But apparently Amram had done a, or Jacob had done a good job with her, with her older daughter too. And she could be trusted to sit, sit there and wait. And, okay, if this happens, run in and say to the pretty princess these words. No, these, th these, say them, these words. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Say them again. Yeah. Princess. Yes. You got it. All right. Keep, again. Okay. You're going to do that. You're not going to be afraid. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the, the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to bathe. And one of her handmaidens probably sees this little basket, bring it over and they open it up. Now, this is, this is where things are difficult. Because her father is the pharaoh that says every male baby has to be thrown into the Nile. Well, they're in the Nile. The Nile is the god of Cyrus, the god of death and resurrection. It's the Nile that overflows its banks uh, every uh, annually, you know, just before uh, or just after sowing. And so waters, it's, 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 the, it's the lifeblood of Egypt. And what pharaoh has basically done is arranged for a huge uh, Holocaust offering to Osiris. And again, you mentioned uh, Prince of Egypt. I, I'm not terribly fond of the movie, but there is one wonderful scene where Moses and his older brother are talking, I believe, and we see on the walls behind them the, the Hebrew babies being thrown into the Nile. Mm -hmm. And basically their blood being shed in the Nile. And now we see the Nile, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time, we see the Nile turning to blood. Basically an eye for an eye. This is what you did to our babies. This is what God is now doing to you. You shed the blood of our babies. He's giving you blood to drink. The justice of God is true and righteous altogether. So there, there's that. The Pharaoh has come up with a genocidal plan that is immersed in magic. We will feed the river, the river will bless us, and we will, in a very pragmatic fashion, destroy this parasitical people within our midst. And the princess knows this, so what's she going to do? And at this point, no doubt the baby cries, because that's what baby does, or baby coo. <laughs> um, and she has to make a choice, and she says... Um, it's this is one of the Hebrews' children, because Jacobed and, and Amram had circumcised Moses. There's there's no reason that the say the skin coloring or the eye shape or anything should have been so different at that point um, that she would be able to pick him out any other way. But doubtless they had circumcised their baby, because the whole thing they're trusting God. Um, she, the princess is going to know up front exactly what she's dealing with. Will she accept this Hebrew baby as human or not? And she does. Um, before she can go much further, Miriam, Jacobed's little girl, wanders in and says, Hi, princess, shall I go get a Hebrew nurse for your, your baby? <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, and there's a turning point in history. Uh, we have a terribly creative uh, woman, a mom full of faith. We have a little girl and we have a princess who can't have her own children. And a bunch of handmaidens looking on and the history of the world pivots there in that papyrus patch. It's an amazing thing. Well, Miriam goes back and gets mom and presents her as... Here is a random Hebrew nurse I just happened to find. <laughs> what a crazy random happenstance. <laughs> yeah. And um, so the princess says, oh, well, here, take my, uh, let's see, the words are, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. Okay, so I now have a permit to take care of my own son. <laughs> I'm going to get paid for it. Uh, the neighbors and the soldiers cannot come and harass me because I have the princess's own uh, insignia or, or whatever, some kind of mark that they will recognize. And now I've got the baby. This is incredible. This is fantastic. God is great. How long do I have? 
Uh, in Hebrew culture, it was about three years to wean a child completely. Uh, Egyptian culture, it seems to have been more like four. Now, at that point, what happened to the child would depend upon class and parents' background and such. A lot of children um, would not get any kind of formal education at all because formal education meant reading and writing and to some extent some mathematics. But if you were nobility or royalty, you would about this time be turned over to the scribes and the priests and you would begin your indoctrination uh, to be a potential deity in Egyptian culture once upon a time. Remember the passage in Hebrews when Moses came of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was in line to be the next Pharaoh. She had no other children. There were no other sons or daughters, no other siblings in the picture. So no Ramesses like in no, the No, <laughs> unlike the in like the movie, there were no competitors. There was simply him. He would be the next Pharaoh unless he chose otherwise. And so the scribes and the, and the priests would, would have their assignment from Pharaoh. He is my grandson. He's in line for the throne. Get him ready. Get him ready to be the son of the divine son. And Jochebed would know this. She would know I've got four years. And they're going to take him away. Now, oftentimes, and, and we see this in, in generally in the history of the world, and it, it pokes itself up in scripture occasionally, that often the nurse would go with the child and be there in the background for a long time. But she would have to be very, very careful about what she said or any kind of interference. So she might be there as the background nurse figure and occasionally be looked to as someone to give a word of advice, but the primary overwhelming focus of the education would come from um, the priests and the scribes who were absolutely immersed in magic, because that was the nature of Egyptian culture. Everything was magical. Everything was rooted in magic and mythology. And we're told later on in scripture that Moses was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He didn't get to opt out. He didn't get to go to the local Christian school or stay home and be homeschooled by mom until high school or college. He, Jacobed had four years. And so that I think is what we should uh, talk about a little bit with what we, with what time we have remaining. And the question that we should turn back on our listeners before we take a shot at it is, so you got four years, what are you going to do? Because we think we've got 12 years or 13 or, uh, you know, 17. And then a couple more after that. 26. <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe. Clearly, the, the only answer is that you, you don't actually have any time because they haven't reached the age of accountability yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, well, I think Brian has pointed out the first thing. Are we going to believe that these children are human? But that is to say that they're the image of God, that they already have a relationship with him for good or evil. And either that, that relationship needs to be changed, they need to be saved, they need to be regenerated, converted, or it needs to be nurtured because they're already children of God. They've come to faith at some point by God's power, and, and they need to grow and learn how to be sound and rooted in that faith so they don't drift away. The, the answers in many ways are easy the process isn't. And um, I, I would like to hear from um, you two about your own Christian education. I'll tell you a little bit about mine later. Um, but uh, Brian, why, why, don't you, why don't you tell us? Um, I, I know your parents are both very godly people. Mm -hmm. um, and so give us, give us some idea of, of what they did to disciple you to Christ, bring you along in the faith. Um, well, I th it's hard because where it started is before my own memory starts. Um, well, you can trust them. That, <laughs> whatever they told you, I'm sure it's more or less accurate. I'm not sure they've told me much about it, though. That's yeah. the problem. Okay. Um, the thing is, is that not everyone acts consistently according to their beliefs. So they, I was in a lot of ways raised like I 
was in a reformed household. They they treated me like somebody who already knew God. And, mm-hmm. you know, the very simple fact that I was brought to church yeah. is evidence of that. When official, you know, education started, uh, I was actually homeschooled up through third, up through second grade. And after that point, I was enrolled in a private school that was founded through my parents' church. And I stayed there until I, I was only, actually, I was only there three years. So through fifth grade. And I don't really remember very much of that time, except for, I think we used a Becca as math, or <laughs> maybe it was Saxon. I forget which. I remember um, those. <laughs> Fun days. I think it was Rebecca. Saxon because when I didn't, doesn't Cornerstone use uh, Abeka? Yes. We used yes. Abeka, now we use Saxon, now we're not using Saxon, Saxon. so much. It's, what? Oh, no, no, we're, we'll no, have no. words later. <laughs> <laughs> and But anyway, um, they, they recognized that I needed education that didn't have uh, a certain bent and that to the contrary, had a different bent. Uh, so one that was, you're saying that the school that you were going to had a certain bent that was not suitable? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. Actually, I'm, I'm saying the opposite. Oh. I'm saying okay. I assume they, it's contrasting my it parents recognized schools. that my education needed to come from a consistent worldview, basically. I don't know quite what their all of their motivation was, but that's kind of the central point and, and one that you know even I, I would hold to now. So. I didn't understand all of that then because I didn't even really know what a public school was. Um, <laughs> I had no experience with them. And then, of course, in uh, sixth grade was when I, I was enrolled in Cornerstone. I stayed there all through high school. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with being placed in the right kind of circumstance. And... I think I've, I'm better for it, um, at least as far as my own development and you know knowledge of the faith that I've grown in over over time. Even even in the homeschool years and in the other private school years, like I know that I was learning more about God, and at the same time applying that knowledge to how I learned everything else. It's it's something that affects the way you learn if you if you understand that God made everything, then you have you have to treat everything that He's made with the same kind of self consistent logic. I feel like I just went on three tangents at once. But, uh, <laughs> well, education th- is you know a very neat and concise topic that can be covered in a single sentence. So. That's true. I I can tweet about this and you don't need more than one. And then of course, you know, you go off to uh, a community college for a few years and it's it's a madhouse. A madhouse, I tell you. <sighs> Let, let's just say that the contrast was noticeable. <laughs> All right. Well, you think some more and we'll come back and more. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. Emily, your your background. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have two older brothers um, and two very godly parents. Um, and my older brothers started off in public school. Um, my oldest brother was in about fifth grade when my mom got tired of having to unteach a lot of things that my brother was bringing home from California public schools, which was really revolutionary in those days. It wasn't a very common thing, um, especially in a family like mine, where I have a lot of aunts and uncles who are public school teachers. Uh, my grandfather's a public school administrator for many years. So uh, it was uh, striking out on one's own a bit in those days. But I think seeing that decision, I was very small at the time. But there came a point when my brothers weren't going to school anymore, and I wasn't of the age yet, but I was like, oh, okay, we're doing this. It's different, you know? But it put me in this mindset of, you know, there's a world out there that's not friendly to us, that's not um, not teaching truth. Um, I think especially in California, I've 
I was always very conscious that my family was different um, because we were Christian and because we believed what we believed and um, because mom taught us those things. Um, so she homeschooled us for quite a while and we went to church and we went to Sunday school um, and it was about sixth grade when I really understood the gospel for the first time. I'm sure my mother had taught me and I'm sure my father had taught me, um, but I remember it clicking and grasping like the legal reality of justification <laughs> in sixth grade um, in Sunday school. I remember the moment. And from there, I was getting to be old enough where mom would ask me questions like, what do you want to study this year? And I think it was in seventh and eighth grade that um, I said, I want to study doctrine. Like I've heard the Bible stories. I want to know what it means. And my fate was sealed. I was a theology nerd from that day on. <laughs> um, and I eventually uh, transferred to, to your school, to Cornerstone. Um, which was absolutely the best choice for us, very beneficial for me. And then I went off to a college that is kind of Christian, but <laughs> I, I picked it because it wasn't in the in those days. Like so, recently it's Hillsdale College. They've changed their marketing a lot to to play up the historic Christianity of the college. It was founded by Free Will Baptists. Um, and they are really ramping up the rhetoric of, we are a Christian college. We're just not associated with any denomination. Um, but that's more in the last few years. When I applied, it was, you know, we want to pursue truth with uh, Judeo-Christian ideals and Greco-Roman culture. <laughs> um, and, and I loved Hillsdale. It was, again, a really great choice for me. That's the story of my education. That's the saga. <laughs> I don't know what else to say or what you were looking for, but that's the story. <laughs> well, uh, it's not so much your stories that I'm interested in as it is your parents' stories, insofar mm -hmm. as, as Brian says, you weren't very old or very conscious of what was going on, <laughs> but I'm hoping that they they told you and they commented mm -hmm. here and there. My own parents' story is very simple. My father was very, very conservative in his thinking politically, um, he had been raised in the church, but had departed from it. So he didn't like the public schools. Mom was a devout Christian, but very poorly taught. And she read the Bible every day. Um, but her understanding of theology was not deep at all. But when the possibility came to put me either in a Christian kindergarten or the public school kindergarten, she she picked a Christian school. And then she went to work providing the money to make that possible because dad's business didn't. And for the rest of my time in school, she worked and paid the bills and was an example of the gentleness and kindness and love of Christ to me. But she did not teach me a great deal. In my early years, I was, I was probably kept from a lot of things that it was good for me to be kept from. But the Christian school movement in those days was just beginning to come into its own, um, barely. Uh, in fact, by the time I reached seventh grade, I believe there was one Christian textbook published in America. Mm -hmm. I think it was called wow. Order, Order and Complexity by, might have been by Bob Jones, I forget. Mm -hmm. But our Creation Research Center, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, that's that's how primitive we were. But my pastor ended up being my teacher. And he taught me a lot and put me on the road to learn more. And when I was in um, high school, a gentleman joined our church who was a voracious reader and just started handing me books. And I read them. They were books on theology. I read them because I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be able to understand them being a ninth <laughs> grader. So he had me one and I'd read it and he'd take it back and he had me another one. And so began my theological education. Was it the best education in the world? No, it wasn't. Uh, and by the time I graduated, I was the only one in the senior class, and there was no junior class, and there wasn't a whole lot of kids in the next couple classes. But it was a place where, at all times, the Word of God was taken to be true. If God, the Bible said it, it was true. We might have to understand what it meant. Interpretation, hermeneutics were always an issue. 
But there was no question that the, what the Bible said was reality. And I was introduced to, to basic creedal thought, to Nicene Chalcedon, to the Heidelberg Catechism, the Westminster Confession, um, to Burkhoff's Systematics, and some things like this. And then I went on to junior college, which was a wonderful experience because my teachers were nice people and were not openly antagonistic for the gospel. Then I went to a Christian college for a couple of years where the teachers were nice people and were at times openly antagonistic to the gospel. Mm. That was a sad thing. But it was it also taught me, here's what the church is going to tell you about the Bible, and, and it's wrong. It, it, it They will reject um, inerrancy, infallibility, the preservation of the text, the biblical hermeneutics, presuppositional apologetics. And I and I decided that if I was going to be a Christian school teacher at the very least, I would do my best to prepare my students for that. Not the attacks from the world, exactly, but the attacks from the church. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can withstand the attacks from the church, they can withstand the attacks from the world. My ministry now for nearly 40 years has been trying to prepare young people at that level. And for the last 25 years, preparing teachers to think that way. Hmm. And uh, part of what we're talking about here, we're talking about parents, homeschool moms, covenant moms and dads. But we're also talking about Sunday school teachers and Christian school teachers and young people who want to mentor younger kids and older brothers and sisters who, who can speak into the lives of their younger siblings. What do you do to prepare young children to face reality? Now, I think we need to say up front, obviously, we don't have a wand of conversion. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there is nothing we can do that can force faith, that can force the new birth. There's no magic. There's no trick. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that we can do that God may well bless because he's a covenant-keeping God who loves to be a God to believers and their seed after them 2,000 generations. Uh, and so that's what I would like to to talk about a little bit. But before before we go there, um, I I know the uh, the article I wrote that um, no, it's not this. It's another article I wrote on the education of Moses. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. uh, begins from a different perspective. Do you remember um, a, uh, a little book by James Clavell called The Children's Story? I love that. I have made so many of my friends read that story. <laughs> Brian, do you remember that? I. I'm not familiar. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's um, bear with me for a moment while I retell the story. It's really short. Uh, you can mm -hmm. probably find it online. Yep. Uh, I have a hardback copy. I've only seen one in my life. It appeared, I think, at one point in Reader's Digest back in the old days. Uh, it started when uh, Clavel's daughter came home from school and, and he was working on becoming an American citizen, wasn't one yet. And she said, I can say a Pledge of Allegiance. So, oh, oh, okay, say the Pledge of Allegiance. I Pledge of Allegiance. And she finishes it and says, okay, can I have my nickel now? What? Teacher says, if I say <laughs> the Pledge of Allegiance, you're going to give me a nickel. Okay. He reaches his pocket, um, puts the nickel in hand. Um, just, uh, can I say it again for another nickel? No, one, one's enough. Just, just <laughs> before you go, dear, um, do you know what the word pledge means? No. Do you know what allegiance means? No, I just have to say Pledge of Allegiance and I get a nickel. All right, thank you, dude. You can go now. And uh, he thought long and hard about that. And he wrote a story. Uh, its setting is the war is over and they have won. And it opens in a classroom of, I think, about first or second graders. And uh, they have won, and the old teacher is about to be sent away to some nice, safe place, and a new teacher is coming. The children are very disturbed about this because the teacher's disturbed. She doesn't know what to say to her little charges, and then they hear the footsteps come down the hallway, and the door opens, and they're thinking it's going to be a monster or some scary thing like the monster's under your bed at night. <laughs> and instead, it's this beautiful young girl teenager uh, who smells wonderful and looks wonderful and is wearing this nice uniform and she comes in and dismisses the old teacher who's now in hysterics 
And uh, she knows all about the children. She knows their names. She knows whose birthday it is. But, um, and she sings to them, beautiful song from her homeland. Uh, and, and she'll answer any of their questions. And um, I'm sure she, she will. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Any, they can have, you can ask me anything, not like your old teacher. Or like your parents. Or like your parents. Oh. Uh, and she says, well, let's, we, we should probably get started. What do you do? Well, um, First, we, we, we call roll. Well, you don't need to call roll because I know all your names. It was, isn't it lazy of a teacher not to know your names and not to know that you're <laughs> here? So we can skip that as long as I'm your teacher. What happens then? Well, we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, all right. Well, everybody stand. We put, we, we, we put our hands on our hearts, right? Yes. Okay. And then we pledge. I pledge. Wait, children. What? No, wait, wait. Pledge. Children, what does pledge mean? And the children look at one another, they look at her, and they can all they can think is, our other teacher never asks us anything like this. This is so weird. Do you know what pledge means? Uh-huh. I think it's something you when you when you want to promise like you're not gonna suck your thumb, you be kind of pledged. That's right. <laughs> How about allegiance? No. Did your other teachers ever explain allegiance? No. Your parents? No. It's just grown up talking, grown up talk like that, and we have to memorize it. Yeah, I got a nickel for saying it, but yeah, I, I had to learn it too, but I never got a nickel. But so no one ever explained these words. To, and then she proceeds to explain the Pledge of Allegiance. So you're saying this piece of cloth is much more important than a real person like you. How can, and in the end, they end up cutting the flag in pieces, throwing it out the window, and then they turn to prayer. I'll let well, you... they, they cut it apart so that each of them can have a piece of it in their pocket. Yeah, because that's it's... so much better. Yeah, it's treasuring it. Yes. Individually. Individually. <laughs> and they go to prayer, and I'm going to let you figure out what that looked like, but it's disastrous. Mm -hmm. and, and in the end, all of the children come to the conclusion that their parents really don't understand life very well and have not been very helpful. And this new teacher is really wonderful. And they kind of want to just be exactly like her, even if it means living with their parents for a while ago and hanging out with her and her friends. And uh, we've been keeping track of the clock, and it's like 20 minutes since the whole thing started. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk a little bit about teaching the forms of the faith. But here is a real, real danger. It's one thing to say... Well, my children know their catechism. They've memorized their memory verses. Do they have any idea what the words mean? Or even to say that they know their creed. Yeah, <laughs> they know what a creed is. I've had, I had um, a freshman ask if he could not memorize the Apostles' Creed because his parents at his church were not fond of such things. They figured it would be better to memorize the Bible. So I let him memorize a Bible passage equal in word count to the Apostles' Creed <laughs> and figured, well, that's on them. Um, we do, for the record, we do memorize a lot of scripture too. But uh, when it comes to the faith, there are some basic things that traditionally young con converts have been taught, old converts for that matter. Mm -hmm. And the, the catechisms organize them um, uh, around them. the Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed the um, Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. It does not require uh, an incredible memory to, to learn these things. And uh, in some churches, they are a matter of rote. They're actually used every Sunday. I, in my case, they were. And, and at least you can, get, you can begin to get these things in the memory of the child. Then you have reference points. By the same token, you can begin to tell them the Bible stories, but of course, here's the danger: story. <laughs> story in back the, in Bible times. Yeah, Bible in times. Bible places. Bible places. Bible people. Yeah, you gotta be careful of that. I, I remember um, when I was a kid. I must have been about kindergarten because um, I had to memorize. Uh, we, we, I went to a Sunday school. Nice lady. I don't even know what her name was anymore. She would teach us Bible stories, but we also had to memorize short Bible verses. I remember wondering which parts of the Bible have the Bible stories and which have the memory verses. Because oh. the books that had the Bible stories sounded a lot better than the ones that probably had the memory <laughs> verses. Oh, <no. laughs> um, 
Another guy I mean, I'm reminded of of a thought I had as a young child where, you know, you read in some of these Old Testament passages like, you know, this this happened. And if you go to that place, you can still see the the, the monument. And yeah. I was thinking, mm. wow, where in Roseville is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there. Uh, <laughs> there is a missionary organization whose name I don't currently remember. I have it written down someplace. Um, I think it's something like new new tribes or new lands or something. Um, when they go into an unreached people group, they take with them two unusual things. They take with them an inflatable globe of the world, and they take a timeline. Mm. And when they when they've broken the language barrier, they can communicate. They say, "This is this this globe thing, this round thing. This is the world we live in. Here's where you live. Here's where we're standing right now. On the other side of the planet, this is where these things we're going to tell you about happen. This is where Israel was. This is where Jesus came. It's a real place." It's far away, but and in here, over here is where I came from. So this message has gone all around the world, and now it's coming to you. And here's a timeline. This, this is a series of events from creation to Christ to now. Right now, you hear. This is how long it took. This is how long a year is. This is how long your lifespan is. This is how long my country's been here. This is, and we go all the way back to Christ and all the way. And so it's set, not in Bible places, Bible times, Bible lands, but it's set in real history and geography. And their their report on their method is it works a lot better and it, it allows more easily for discipleship. There's a framework in terms of which all this operates. Uh, there, the, the danger that I, I've seen, my wife has seen so often, is that Bible stories just kind of float in air and they become something like inspired veggie tales or... Mm. Uh, Aesop's fables. They, they're they not rooted in what came before, what follows. They're just there. Um, and um, They're floating like moralistic sermons, basically. That's exactly what they are. And that's one thing we absolutely have to be aware of when we teach our children. They, they need to know that we're talking about realities. Because if we teach them uh, in such a way that the gospel and all of the supporting history uh, geography is just, you know, moralistic, uh, floating some things. Um, that's not going to stand up against the real world. That's not going to stand up against the the rationalism and the scientism of of your average university class, or, or even because especially when you like when you realize that the people that the Bible talks about were not perfect. If they've yeah. been held up to you as heroes, you know, you've yeah. got the little. Bible character collectors cards, like baseball cards, <laughs> that are oh, just please. like, oh, here's Abraham, the father of faith. Um, so, like, when when it hits you that mm, he didn't live totally uprightly and perfectly, that's a, a shock to the system if you've mm. not already been presented with the grace of God. So we we were talking about. Um, the historical framework, the stories, the the histories. Uh, mm -hmm. I've I've done this before, um, uh, and so David slew the giant. Noah took all the animals onto the ark because God so loved the world. And Peter saw this big sheet with animals in it, uh, but Jeremiah cried a lot, and that's the Bible, children. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> or. Um, so Wesley had been nearly dead all day, but, um, <laughs> there, there was a ship following and maybe they were using the same wind because true love is undying, but <laughs> no one has ever survived the fire swamp. And that's the story, children. We are men of action. <laughs> well, do not become us. <laughs> yeah. Try doing that with any other book or movie like Princess Bride. And you're lost, and, and no one's going to listen to that. I mean, once we know something, sure, we keep going back to our favorite scenes, our favorite chapters, our favorite lines again and again. Once we know it. But when yeah. you're trying to teach it for the first time, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But we do it a lot. Um, and um, we, we, we need to have the same framework the Bible has, which is to say a, a consistent history, storyline, timeline, 
with a basic knowledge of Middle East geography, at least as a starter. And then in terms of that, we have the covenants that God has made with his people as they develop and uh, fold out into one another and are transformed into one another from Adam to Christ. Uh, and, and again, God has given us, as it were, placeholders and markers and things that where the gospel becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. It's the same gospel all the way through. Mm -hmm. But moralism, dispensationalism, uh, emotionalism within the churches, and, and, and above all, a low view of children, I think, has mm -hmm. robbed a lot of that. We think that children are not capable of learning or understanding these things. And I, as I've watched Christian school teachers and, and, and parents, and this is this is a harsh judgment I'm going to make, but I think what I see far too often is that these adults don't work at teaching their children in greater depth because the parents, teachers themselves, don't understand it in greater depth. And they cannot imagine that their small children could understand what they do themselves do not understand. Mm. And so we, we we have this idea of, well, if you're in kindergarten, you know this much. In second grade, you can learn this much. Fourth grade, you can learn this much. You obviously couldn't learn any more than that because I don't even know much more than that, but I'll try to get you there. And that's horrible. Uh, mm -hmm. Years ago, I started a uh, enrichment class uh, that I do over the summers, sort of fun summer, summer school. And it was sort of to prove this, this contention. And I started with fourth, kids who just graduated from fourth grade, fourth up through whenever. And I would teach them the history of the world, the history of philosophy, and basic theology, economics, and political science in two weeks. <laughs> they had no difficulty learning any of it. Now, do they understand it all thoroughly and remember it all forever? Probably not. But then most high school students don't either. Nor do most of college <laughs> students. But the problem was not in understanding it. The problem would just be, you, you know, when you're talking about things like that, you have to keep on learning and keep on thinking about it, keep on using those words. Children are not stupid. And one, and, and he, we're talking about Jacobet here. She had four years. Um, how much can you teach in four years, starting from scratch? Well, enough that Moses was able to face the universities of Egypt and come out with his faith unscathed, he still believed the promise in spite of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as we as we we teach the framework, we teach the forms, we teach the prayers, uh, we teach the songs. And here's a side note. And we teach real songs, not stupid kitty songs. We teach <laughs> the songs of the faith that stress the attributes of God and our absolute need and dependence for him and on him. Uh, as we do that, and then secondly, as we live these things out before our kids, including our own failures, if we, if we can't turn to our children and say, honey, dad just really screwed up. I sinned. Please forgive me. This was I was wrong. Will you forgive me? If we can't do that, we we don't have anything to start from. Now, again, we have to be careful. None of this is magic. None of this is a trick. None of this tricks our kids into trusting in Jesus or believing the Bible. And if we trick them, they might realize later that they were they tricked. They were tricked, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's less about trying to find the right combination of actions to make sure that your child believes and more about just you know acting in in terms of the faith that you claim to believe in the first place Absolutely. and being a good witness that way. Absolutely. And so we we teach our children the faith better than we know it which means we have to learn it. We have to set our hearts and minds to mastering a great deal we don't know. Emily's remark earlier about wanting, teach me doctrine. I want to be a theology nerd. Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. Um, that's that's what we should want from all of our children. That's not all they should want to learn. They should want to learn. There are all different kinds of children with different gifts and, and abilities and interests. But understanding and fearing God, that's that's got to be the center of everything. And that's where we need to invest our time. That's what Jacobet had to do. She also probably had to explain why the myths of Egypt were stupid and not to be trusted <laughs> and why the the magic, the magic medicines and the magic funeral pr uh, procedures of Egypt were stupid and not to be followed. There was a lot to talk about. 
And probably everything that came along was an opportunity. You couldn't walk out down the streets of Egypt and not see some carved image that would be an opportunity to talk about the God of Israel as over against the false gods of Egypt. And she took every single one she did. Um, I know my own wife was, was marvelous about this with our children, far better than I was. Um, she'd walk out in the garden and take one of the girls and say, oh, look at this rose that God made for us to enjoy. And she wasn't being sappily moralistic. She was telling the truth among the many reasons that God put that rose right then, right there, was so that on that morning they could enjoy it together. And there was nothing mm -hmm. wrong with praising God for it. She didn't have to yeah. force things. They were all around and they still are. And so as as you have both borne witness to, as you as your education proceeds, there's a lot of stuff. Everything becomes a reason to talk about the word of God and what God says about these things. And that God's word is reality. And the religion of our secular schools is not. It's something very different. What other things, before we, we, we draw to a close, what other things come to mind in terms of your own education or the, the education you plan on giving your own children one day or advice you would give? Um, I would just, there, there is one thing, and uh, the reason I bring it up is because I see these debates raging on Reformed Internet all the time. <laughs> Not everyone can teach from home. I, I think that they should try. But not everyone can, mm -hmm. and more so, not everyone can afford to pay for private school. Yeah. It is not a sin for people to find themselves in a situation where their children have to go to public school. It's not ideal, obviously. We we don't want to give our children over to learning in depth the spirit of the age yeah. as an indoctrinary mm -hmm. Uh, indoctrinating indoctrinate that thing yeah um <laughs> well we have but... we have jacobet as as a prime example she had mm -hmm. no choice in what happened to moses the yeah. action she took to save his life necessarily would commit him to what we would think of as a secular school education mm -hmm. yep. and she did not hold back on that account well better death than be surrendered to those atheists or polytheists or whatever <laughs> no she trusted god for it but as you say it was hardly ideal Indeed. It's not a sin to send your kids to public school, but it is a sin to fail to bring them up in the nurture ad and admonition oh, of the Lord. Absolutely. Like you do have to a be discipling your children. It. Yeah, it just it's going to be a whole lot harder. Mm -hmm. Not not that it's ever easy. Yeah. And and again, yeah. the thing that um, as I was looking over the things that I've written on this, um, and let's not forget to pray for our kids because although yeah. we mm -hmm. can't, we don't have the power of conversion and regeneration. God does. Mm -hmm. and, and he listens to us. And he listens to us because it's his good will to do so. He's promised to. Mm -hmm. And so we pray for our children constantly uh, up to the moment where they say, hey, dad, I'm a Christian. And way beyond that, every day, mm -hmm. keep on praying. They yeah. grow, that their faith would be real, and that God would sustain them, protect them. Because, again, all the stuff that we, we, we've we taught them, as important as it may be, as useful as it may be, is not a guarantee but they're going to use it the right time in the right way. God takes many of his children on into, into greater grace through dark valleys and deep pits mm -hmm. and bloody warfare. Yeah, that's in his mm -hmm. hand. Yes. Yeah. Well, I One think... thing I would Go add ahead. as well. Um, I remember one time in staff devotions when I was a uh, teacher's apprentice at your school, Greg, a story from the first grade teacher mm -hmm. where... She had been teaching, oh, I don't remember exactly what part of the Old Testament, but at the school, we teach through the whole Bible. That's yeah. one of the, the big things is all of it. Yeah. And the teacher had pointed out some of the gospel in the Old Testament of God bringing the nations to his people. Um, and she asked one of the kids, what, what does that mean? And the kids said, it means that God loves all people everywhere. And that was such a beautiful picture to me of both the child's capacity to understand mm -hmm. far more than we give them credit for. And also, it doesn't 
do to get too nitpicky yeah. <laughs> about the theology? Because, yeah. like, you know, if you're a cage stage Calvinist, you're probably like, well, loves, but not salvifically. Jacob, have I loved? You saw, have I hated? You know? God may or may not have a, a wonderful rest. plan for your That's life. That's not helpful. That's not discipling your children. If they say in their children's words the truth of God's love and his free offer of the gospel to the whole world, praise the Lord praise for that. Praise God indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, when the apostles themselves didn't exactly get the uh, come and see him of whom Moses uh, in the law and the prophets did write Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's so much wrong with that, <laughs> but John included it in his gospel as one of the first testimonies to Jesus. So yeah, we 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 allow for immaturity just as God allows for it in us. We have not always been right, and neither were our children. But if they're trying to understand the gospel and trying to grow in their love for God, we encourage them. Mm -hmm. So let's do some real quick recos before we go, because we're way over time. (laughs) I'm sure we are. (laughs) Greg, do you want to go first? Yes. I am reading. uh, Someone has already recommended this, but I'm going to recommend it again anyway, because I just finished the first volume of Lord of the Rings because my wife made the mistake of leaving it out and I commandeered it. (laughs) The woman that God gave to you left this book out. Zipped to where she was and then passed her and just finished it. And it is (laughs) wonderful again, not only to be in Middle Earth, but this time I especially appreciated Tolkien's... um, command of description and and travel narrative Mm. just to without the jar without exaggeration just i'm i'm walking through a very beautiful place and he's not hitting me over the head exactly with how beautiful it is nor things flashing part of the problem is i just finished reading um pd james mystery british mystery writer who keeps hitting you in the eyes and ears with her description. It's just really <laughs> super annoying. And to come to Tolkien, who is just so gentle in his approach and so measured in his language and doesn't pick some five-syllable word that no one ever uses it and then has to use it every <laughs> other page, P.D. James. Um, <laughs> it was just, just on that basis alone. It was so refreshing and, mm. and pulled me into the story and... I love the story, but this time I was really learning to love the language and the, and the storytelling style. So, mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. Good reco. Good reco. Brian? You'll have to stop me if I've already recommended this once before, because I have a, a terrible track record with remembering what I've recommended before. Uh, there is a app that I use, and for anyone who goes to used bookstores a lot, and looks for books that you want to read and gets there and thinks, do I already own this book? <laughs> I, I have saved so much money just from having this app. It is called Libib, L-I-B-I-B. I believe it's on both Android and iOS. I'd be surprised if it wasn't on iOS, honestly. They seem to make the app for that first and then yeah. poorly migrated over to android <laughs> yeah. um but it, it's very good it lets you scan the isbn barcode mm. which will then automatically enter all of the information you didn't want in the first place but it'll put <laughs> everything you wanted as well yeah editor um, place of publication <laughs> exactly so, and you can use it for books and anything else that has an isbn so movies and you know, blu-rays and dvds and um audio books and uh little you know, Ligonier DVD sermon sets. It, it, it works for everything. It's great. Which, Wonderful. if you have a lot of books that were printed before the creation of ISBNs, it gets a little annoying. But yeah. <laughs> that's that the only be. time you have to do any kind of manual entry. Libib, L-I-B-I-B. Okay. Great. And Emily? I am also going to double down on a recommendation that's come before <laughs> um, because I just finished reading Peace Child ah. um, by ah. Don Richardson. Uh, my mom actually went to Prairie Bible Institute, which is where the story starts when he decides he's going to go to Erie and Jaya. Mm-hmm. So I feel like a little personal connection to the story. Um, but it's the story of some missionaries. We've talked about this before, but I'll do a recap. Missionaries that go to uh, Netherlands, New Guinea, New Guinea um, to preach the gospel to an unreached tribe there. Um, and they find 
they, you know, finally get through the language barrier and establish rapport and all these things. And he's like, finally, I can, I can tell them about Jesus. And he tells them the story of Jesus or the narrative or history or account of Jesus, <laughs> if you prefer. Um, and at first they're not really interested. And then they get to like the last supper and they're like really starting to perk up. And, and he's like, great, I, I'm reaching them. And they're like, wait, so Judas <laughs> was friends with Jesus for three years before betraying him. And he's like, yeah, isn't that awful? They're like, Judas is the coolest. Um, <laughs> because in this culture, they exalt betrayal um, and treachery. And they have this whole ritual of uh, fattening the pig before slaughter, fattening someone with friendship before betraying them and cannibalizing them. Um, and so the missionary has to figure out how do I teach Jesus in this place where this is what they value? Um, and I'd heard about the concept of the story before, but it wasn't until I read it that I found out how really thrilling the story is as well. Mm -hmm. So it is worth reading for many, many reasons. So Peace Child by Don Richardson. Okay. Thanks. And that is all the time we have for tonight. So thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. I love talking about Christian education and hope we will do more in the future. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our supporters. If you would like to join their number, you can visit our Anchor homepage at anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Um, we would love to hear your parenting stories. If you want to send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com, let us know how you're discipling your children. We would enjoy reading that. I hope to see you next week. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. Take care. Thank you.